Well, the time has come. It's been a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Wonderful lectureship. And like all good things in this life, anyway, they do must come to an end. It's going to be one of the most wonderful things about heaven, though. It won't. It won't come to an end ever. A few things before I get into my uh, lesson. Um, three different uh, men have uh, indicated they'd like to say a, a word or two. Uh, and at the close, uh, after we do the Lord's Supper, uh, if, if anybody needs to partake of that, and then we will uh, have Brother Estudis come up and, and say a few words, and then Brother Stanio after him, and then Brother Cauley. Uh, and uh, I'll probably be sitting down by then, so that's why I'm saying it now, so I won't uh, have to later. Um, I appreciate, I haven't got to maybe say this to every speaker, but I appreciate the obvious time and preparation that's went into all the lessons. You could tell that these men have spent many hours in preparing uh, their lessons. And I know uh, many times more people will uh, download these lessons, listen to these lessons from the Internet than actually heard them this weekend. Uh, that's another wonderful thing about this format uh, is the people that are reached through it. Uh, so while there was a lot of good done, uh, done during this lectureship here, uh, a lot more will probably be done in the coming days, weeks, months, uh, and so forth. This morning when I was at Stark City, one of the questions they asked me was about the preacher's files. So they were very interested in knowing about it. So I, I plugged the preacher files for some time, talking about exactly what it was and you know the, the reason it was started and, uh, and so forth. And I think several people were quite interested in it. So uh, I can imagine that uh, many of them will be hitting on that website uh, in the near future. Uh, and that's a wonderful thing. It really, really is. Uh, it's a wonderful way to reach uh, people who may not want to talk to someone originally in person, but they really have serious questions about, uh, about their lives, about the next life, about salvation, about God, uh, a number of things. So I am very thankful to all of you who are part of that uh, and make that uh, such a wonderful teaching tool. Uh, you uh, need to be thanked, and, and I want to thank you for that. And thank you for allowing me to close this lectureship. My daughter asked me about the lesson tonight and about its length. And I said, well, I know one thing because of how... It's not going to be as long as I'd planned. Uh, such is life, though. God versus the world. Uh, so many have addressed the idea of the difference between God's view and man's, man's view. That I won't go into that very much. But even the, the idea of who God is is greatly different between what the world says and what the Bible says. You've seen those surveys yourself about what, what people think about God and, and who, what He's like and His nature and is there a heaven and is there a hell. So many more people believe in heaven than, there, than they do hell. But you know, if one exists, the other one has to as well. There's no way you can have one without the other. But yet, so many in the world want to believe in heaven. Oh, there's a place of, of great wonder and, and reward and a wonderful place. But the idea that, that God is such a God that He could punish certain men eternally in hell, that just, that just couldn't possibly be true. So my theme, my thesis statement tonight is simply that God is just in punishing men eternally. And that's the point I want to, to drive home. It, and there are others, I hope, but that's the main one. 
is that God is just in punishing men eternally. And as we start out, I want to focus on, number one, the nature of God. Because it is, it's because of His nature that He must punish men eternally. Because of who He is. Again, you go to the world and you ask people what God is like. Uh, they'll say the God of love. He certainly is, right? First John 4, 8, God is love. He is a loving God. He's a merciful God, Psalms 86, 15, right? He's abounding in mercy. He's full of compassion. That's the God we serve. He's loving. He's merciful. He's compassionate. And you and I know that, and we're very, very thankful that the God we serve has those characteristics. And for many people in the world, that's the end of the story. That's it. God is merciful and loving and He's compassionate and He's going to end up saving everybody. All you have to do is, is ask most people in the world if, if they're going to be saved and absolutely. They are, sure. Why? Well, because God is merciful and He's compassionate and He's loving. He therefore could not punish people eternally in hell. He simply could not do that. The Bible says that's not the end of the story. The Bible tells us, the Word informs us, that there is, if you want to call it that, another side of God. The Bible says He's loving, He's merciful, but He's also holy. Can you imagine the number of times in the Bible, Old and New Testaments, where God is said to be holy? He even said Himself, Leviticus 19.2, I, the Lord your God, am holy. He is a holy God. That is His nature. That's just as much who He is as the fact that He's a loving God and a merciful God and a compassionate God. He is also, at the very same time, a holy God. Recall the words that He, he told Moses when uh, Moses was there in the burning bush. You know, take your shoes off. You're standing on holy ground. Why? Because God is holy. A holy God cannot, by, the, by His very nature, allow unholiness, incorruption, impurity in His presence. He can't. It goes against His very nature. He is a holy God. And with that holiness comes the idea, comes the characteristic, the quality that He is a just God. God of justice. If you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 32 and read a, a very critical passage there dealing with who God is and the fact that He's a just God. Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 4. Th these are some of the final words of Moses. Moses is not going to be allowed to go into the promised land. He's kind of giving some final words to the Israelites. And he's talking here in Deuteronomy 32 about who God is. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4 says, He is the rock, His work is perfect, for all His ways are justice. A God of truth and without injustice. Righteous and upright is He. When you look at those words that either in the Old or, or New Testament are translated as just or justice, you get the idea of Things that are right. If something is just, it's right. It's proper. It's fitting. It's lawful. All of those might be synonyms in, in different occasions. For just or for justice. So when God is said to be a God of justice, He is God of doing what's right. Don't the God of all the world do what's right? Absolutely. So He does what is right. He does what is just. He does what is fitting. He does what is proper. He does what is lawful. And so there we have kind of a summary of God. He, he, he's very merciful. He's very compassionate. He's very loving. He's full of those things. He's also a God that's holy and a God that's just. And all of, the, all of those things together describe our God, the God to whom we serve. So there are, if you want to call it that, two sides of God. But the world only wants to look at one. 
But yet, when Paul wrote to the church at Rome, Romans chapter 11, verse 22, he made the very point that there are these two aspects of God. Romans chapter 11, verse 22, Paul writes, Therefore, consider, think about, focus on, meditate on, here's the two sides, the goodness and the severity of God. He says, on those who fail, severity, but toward you, goodness. But notice the condition he, he next says here. If you continue in His goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. Notice there the, the two sides, the two natures there. Goodness, severity. The world says God is, is just goodness. There's not a severe side to God. Paul says that's not true. There are two sides of God. Goodness and severity. In that same letter that he wrote to the church at Rome, in Romans chapter 2, he actually spends a good part of that chapter talking about those two aspects of God. Romans chapter 2, beginning in verse 4, Paul writes, Do you despise the riches of His goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? How many people does God wish to send to hell. Not a single one. He doesn't want that. He doesn't delight in, in, in the death of people. Going back to Ezekiel 18. He doesn't delight in people dying. He doesn't delight that people choose to disobey Him. Certainly makes that point in Second Peter chapter 3. Right? God is long-suffering. He suffers long with us, and I'm glad He does. He's long-suffering to us. He doesn't want anybody to perish. But He wants everybody to come to repentance. Jesus didn't come yesterday, did He? So far, He hasn't came today. How should I view that as a Christian? I should view that as, I have one more opportunity to make things right. One more opportunity. Tomorrow, I may either not wake up, or Jesus may come. And when either one of those things happen, my chances, my opportunities to make things right, to repent, are finished. They're over. So I need to look at the fact that, that God is long-suffering, that Jesus has not come back yet, as an opportunity to repent. And that's the way every single individual in the world needs to view the fact that they're still alive. God is giving them, He's suffering along with them, so they have one more opportunity, one more day to make things right, one more day to do what's right. And He's giving them that because there is going to be one morning that I wake up, that you wake up, that that will be the very last morning. Whether it's us leaving this world, passing away, or Jesus coming, there will be a last morning for us. So this could be the last day. The morning we, we woke up to this morning, that, that might be the last one. But if not, we need to view it as, well, okay, God has given me one more day to do what's right. To make changes, to, to obey. Whatever it is I need to do, He's given me one more opportunity. He doesn't want to send anybody to hell. Nobody whatsoever. Let's go on. Romans chapter 2, the next verses, Paul writes, But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourselves wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. More to that in a minute. Who will render to each one according to his deeds. God doesn't arbitrarily send people to hell, does He? I know some apparently teach that in the religious world, but it's not true. Why will people be punished eternally? Because of what they've done. That's what he says right there. Each one according to his deeds, and that's taught in a number of other places as well, but each one according to his deeds. It's not my intentions. A lot of people may have intentions of doing what's right, intentions of obeying, intentions of, of doing whatever, but those intentions mean nothing unless there's an action involved. 
That's the same way with belief, right? And faith. I may believe in God, but if that belief doesn't make me do something, that faith is worthless. That is a dead faith, as was mentioned earlier. Nothing whatsoever good will come out of that unless I actually do something. I may be given all kinds of abilities, but those abilities will not save me unless I use them. So that's why he says everyone's going to be judged according to their deeds, what you do. Well, some people say, well, uh, I, I'm not going to do something, so he, he can't judge me for that. Sure, because you've done something. You've chosen not to do it. And that's doing something. So we are judged by what we do. Good intentions. Remember what they say about that road to hell. Paved with good intentions. So many people will be in hell because of that. They intended to do it. They intended to do it. They intended to do it. And then finally, that last day came. And the opportunity was gone. And the intentions simply sent them to everlasting punishment. As we go on, those actions are, are further emphasized in the next few verses. After he says, who will render to each one according to his deeds, he says, eternal life. There's one possible end. To those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness. Here's their end. Indignation and wrath and tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also of the Greek. Notice it's the doing. Doing good, doing evil. Doing what's right, doing what's wrong. It's based on doing. And so much the religious world says what we do makes no difference. But yet the Bible repeatedly says it does make a difference. What we do makes a difference. Whether we choose to do good or whether we choose to do evil. We will be judged by those decisions we make about what we do. Again, not our intentions, not what we want, not our desires, not even our abilities, unless we put them to use. It's what we do that matters. He says those are the ends, those are the possibilities. So where you and I spend eternity then is all about how and what we choose. Verse 11, for there is no partiality with God. God may have given you all kinds of abilities, all kinds of resources, all kinds of opportunities, but those on the day of judgment will not be what you're judged by. It's what you do. So God, again, doesn't arbitrarily pick you or not pick you to go to heaven. It's about what you do in this life. What you do with what you're given. And that's how we're going to be judged. And that's the just side of God. That is. That's the just side of God. He mentioned, and I said we were going to go back to it, there in verse 5, about the righteous, the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. If God is just, and we've seen that He is, if God is just, then the fact that He's just necessitates He must punish those who don't obey. He must, by His nature, the fact that He's just, He must do that. Otherwise, he'd be going against his nature. This, of course, is, is seen clearly in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, a, a passage that most of you probably know by heart. Um, those Thessalonian Christians, especially if you read the first letter, they were kind of worried and confused about the people that had already died. All right? they, were, they, they were really concerned about them, you know, What's happened to them and will we see them again and in what way and so forth. And so he writes there in chapters 4 and 5 about kind of giving them some encouragement. Well then, recall that many of those Thessalonian Christians had been persecuted. 
people ha had caused all kinds of suffering and afflictions on them. So we come to the second letter, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and he writes to them to give them comfort. Those Christians who had been suffering and who had been persecuted. So he says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6, he says, It is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. What does he say? It's the right thing to do. It is the right thing to do. These Christians were being persecuted. People were causing them affliction. So he says God's going to repay, recompense. They've caused you affliction. God's going to afflict them. They've caused you tribulation. God's going to cause them tribulation. They've caused you to suffer. God's going to cause them to suffer. And he says here, by inspiration, that is a right thing. It's just, it's fitting. Why? Again, because of God and who He is. His very nature necessitates the fact that He repay those individuals. He says that's the right thing to do. It is righteous. It's demanded by His nature. Not from our viewpoint, from God's viewpoint. From His standpoint, it is the right thing to do. We go on. The next two verses there in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 says, And to give you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. What's He going to do? Take vengeance. Can't I do that? Nope. He says specifically, the Hebrew writer says it, and, and quotes Deuteronomy uh, when Paul writes to the church at Rome, Romans chapter 12. He quotes the exact same verse. It says, Vengeance is mine. I'll repay, says the Lord. Not you and I. And you know why I think that's the case? Because you and I would mess it up. I don't know all the facts. I read your heart, your mind, your motives. I, I don't know any of those things. So I couldn't possibly take vengeance and repay Justly, but God can because He knows every single fact, He knows every single thought, every single motive. He's the only one with the wisdom, the power, the intelligence to do it exactly right. So He says, Vengeance is mine. So is God a vengeful God? Well, absolutely. He's not a vindictive God. There's a big difference between vengeance and vindictiveness. God's not vindictive, but He's taking vengeance. Why? He must take vengeance. Again, by his nature, he must take vengeance. He's a just God and he's a holy God and those characteristics, those qualities demand he take vengeance. I mentioned a while ago, God doesn't arbitrarily send people to hell. You know, God doesn't send anybody to hell. He really doesn't. God doesn't send anybody to hell. People choose to go there by their actions. He doesn't send people, and, and you often hear that, and I've probably said it myself, God's going to send that person to hell. That's really not a scriptural way to describe it. People send themselves there by their choices. And again, choices go back to what you do. If you don't make a choice, you do something. You say, I'm not going to make a choice. I'm not going to do that. Well, you just did. You made a choice. So it's all about what you do. He goes on, next two verses, talking about those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel. He says, these, those individuals, shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power when, when He comes in that day. That's when he's going to do it, when he comes, that last final day. He says they'll be punished with everlasting destruction. And, of course, many religious groups teach that people will be annihilated. Well, you can't annihilate somebody everlastingly. That, that's, that doesn't even make sense. That's illogical, isn't it? Destruction's primary idea is, in this case, separation from God. Ruin. People are going to be ruined spiritually because they are forever 
eternally, everlastingly separated from God. All that, that's good and, and joyful and, and happy and pleasurable, all of that they're going to be away from. And not just for a long period of time, but forever. Nothing could be worse than that. Jesus said there's going to be a group of people, recall Matthew 7, 21 through 23, there's going to be a group of people who, who, who really thought, you know, they had prophesied in His name, cast out demons in His name, done all these wonderful things in His name, and then Jesus is going to come back and said, I never knew you. And notice the next word, depart. That's destruction right there. Depart from me. Never get to be in His presence again, Ever throughout eternity. One of the, the most interesting things I found in this study was this. Some of you I know this, but I didn't. And that's the word righteous, the word just or justice, the word vengeance, and the word punishment all come from the same Greek root word. All four of them. And I did not know that. All four of them do that. And when I was looking in some of my Greek references, I thought, oh, that's got to be a mistake because I'd read that somewhere. There's no way those come from the same Greek word. And they do. I looked at that. I was just stunned. And the more I thought about it, the more I said, you know, those are interconnected. God is just. He's a God of justice. Therefore, He does what's right. He's righteous. And because He does what's right, He's going to take vengeance on those who do not know God, do not obey the, the gospel. And because he does that, then he must punish them. So all four of those are connected. And so I saw, after doing that kind of word study, how those all fit together. Kind of uh, one chain, if you will. And I thought that was, was very appropriate when we look at the God of justice, because that's exactly what he is. That leads us kind of to the last thing, the dilemma God was in. He's a, he's a loving God, a merciful God, a compassionate God who wants everybody to be saved. At the same time, holy God and a just God and demands righteousness. So how can He be show mercy and be just at the same time? That, that was where He was. How did He do that? Well, people couldn't do it. I couldn't come up with a plan to save myself. I couldn't do it. A group of people couldn't do it. The whole people, all the people that's ever lived couldn't do it. So how was God going to be able to do that? You know, maintain the fact that He's holy and just, but at the same time provide a means of escape for the guilty so that He could declare them not guilty. He could justify them. How could He do that? And we know there was only one way to do that. And that was by allowing His Son to pay the penalty for us. That was the only solution. There weren't any others. That was it. To allow His Son to come and die for not just the sins of a few, but the sins of all. And that's what Jesus had to do on the cross. So why did He die? It was for you and I. You and I could not in any way justify ourselves. We had to be justified by God. And that was done through His Son. A number of years ago, the London Times sent out to a number of the, the religious scholars, the theologians of the time, this was several decades ago, to answer the question, what is wrong in the world? And they got a bunch of, of very learned essays back from many men, pages and pages long. The one that most people remember was, was answered by G.K. Chesterton, most of you who know who that is. His reply to the question, what's wrong with the world or in the world, his answer was, dear sirs, I am. Here's truth. All that's wrong in the world comes back to the fact that you and I sin. That, that's what it's all about, sin. And there's no way we can be justified, pronounced not guilty of those sins by anything you and I could do in and of ourselves. So that's why Jesus had to come. That's why He had to die 
That's why he had to shed his blood. Is this the last day? I have no idea. Jesus may not come for a long, long time. All of us in here may live for, for many weeks, months, years. I don't know. But I do know that one thing we need to be thankful for is that God is long-suffering and He's giving us another opportunity to do what's right, to make things right, to repent. For those outside that body of Christ who've never had their sins washed away, they've never come in contact with the blood, tonight may be your, your chance to do that, your time to do that. To have your sins washed away by the blood of Christ. But the Bible teaches, does not teach, once baptized, always saved. The Bible says we need to continue to have our sins cleansed, washed away. No, we don't have to be baptized over and over again. The Bible says from 1 John 1 and other places that we need to continue to confess our wrongs, to repent, to ask God to forgive us. Sometimes that needs to be done publicly. And so as we close our lectureship, I want to give you an opportunity to make things right. And if you need to do that tonight, I encourage you to come as we stand and sing this invitation song.